Good evening. Welcome, everybody, to this wonderful institute talk. My name is Kirsten Adepli. I'm a professor of biology here and vice provost. And it is an absolute delight and an honor for me to introduce our speaker this evening, Professor Dame Lindra, Linda Partridge. Um, if I were to uh, describe all of her accolades and accomplishments, we wouldn't have any time for her to speak to, uh, to you tonight about this very interesting topic of aging. So I will try to keep it brief, um, and I know that it won't do her incredible, illustrious career justice, but here we go. Um, so Professor Partridge received her PhD at Oxford, she did her postdoc at York, and then she moved as a faculty member to the University of Edinburgh. Um, during this time, she really pioneered the study of aging. She has um, really been um, done pretty much all of the early landmark studies on longe longevity and aging, both in the context of the evolution of aging and more recently on the molecular mechanisms of aging. She moved in 1994 to University College London, um, and then in 2008, she was the inaugural um, and founding director of the Max Planck Institute for the Biology of Aging. Any of us who know the Max Planck Institute know that this is um, an incredible honor and it's an incredible amount of work. Um, so for her to um, go to the Max Planck in Germany while ma also maintaining a lab in London at the same time really speaks to um, her fortitude and not only her skills as a biologist but as a, a, a leader. Um, she um, left the Max Planck um, uh, and moved back to London last year. And since 2019, she maintains her lab at UCL. And since 2019, she's been the biological secretary for the Royal Society of London, which I have just learned is an incredible job maintaining all of the work related to policy, appointments, fellowships, and more. She has many, many, many awards. In addition to being a, a dame and the commander of the Order of the British Empire, she is a member of the European Molecular Biology Organization. She's been awarded the Darwin Medal, the Mendel Medal. She has over 600 publications and, um, and continues to publish in the absolute highest and most well-respected journals. Um, she has given lectures all over the world, and she really is a beacon for us in our um, in the field of aging, in the field of biomedicine, and it is an absolute honor to have her here with us tonight. So with that, I would like to invite her to the stage to give her lecture on intervening in aging to prevent age-related diseases. Thanks very much, Kirsten, for an extraordinarily kind introduction. Thank you all for coming. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's my first time in Abu Dhabi, and it, it's really exciting to, to see what's going on. And I must apologize, I've got laryngitis. But if I continue speaking, I think it will gradually clear, and I hope it's not too painful listening to it. So can we intervene in aging? Um, we've certainly been pretty good at uh, making ourselves live longer. It's a trend that started uh, way back in the middle of the 19th century, so 1840 on the left here, coming up to projected 2040, and this is life expectancy. So how long the average person is expected to live. And each spot on the curve is the country that was the world leader at the time. So to start with, that tended to be the Scandinavian countries, various others in between. Now it's the Far East. I think South Korea has the highest life expectancy for both sexes. And the trend was attributable to different things at different times. So to start with, it was largely um, reductions in perinatal and infant mortality, then improvements in lifestyle, better food, cleaner water, and so on. Then antibiotics, immunization, and now in developed countries, actually, the main increase in lifespan is happening in the older section of the population. Okay, I hope you got all that. <laughs> okay, good. Um, 
And what the horizontal lines here represent is various people's or organizations' predictions of where the trend would top out, you know, what the intrinsic limit on human lifespan would turn out to be. And what you can see is that it shot past all of them and actually continues. So these are the recent figures for the Emirates. So, so this is just a 10-year range now, but otherwise the same thing, life expectancy at birth up the vertical axis. Um, and the blue line at the top is women, and the black line below is men. And you can see that when things were going normally, which they were for, for most of that period, you were seeing the roughly 2.5 year per decade increase that was typical of this worldwide increase. And that's very typical for, for most developed countries. Um, you can also see very sadly the effect of the pandemic in the last year. Um, of course, old people were particularly vulnerable to COVID. And again, that's a very typical picture in most parts of the world. And women live longer than men everywhere. It's an absolutely um, standard finding. Um, but unfortunately, they're generally not healthy extra years. Women tend to have a longer period of disability and ill health at the end of life um, than men do. But that aside, it's really something to celebrate, I think. We've improved our living conditions, we've improved our medical care, and so for a given age, people are healthier, and so they're living longer. And that's, of course, leading to some very um, remarkable lifespans. I think these, these are two interesting ladies. Um, so the one on the left, in theory at least, is the world record holder so far. Um, she was a French lady, um, born in 1875 in the south of France, although she eventually moved uh, north to Rouen. And she died at the age of about 122 and a half. And it's not at all clear why her, um, her family were fairly long-lived. There's a slight heritability um, to human lifespan. On the other hand, she was a terrible um, example of a healthy uh, lifestyle. Um, she rode a bicycle till she was 100, admittedly, but she didn't give up smoking until she was 117. So not, not clear what her secret was. And actually, she may have had a darker secret, um, which is that she may have been her daughter. It's possible that her daughter impersonated her in order to keep collecting her pension. And this is a problem with some of the very old records. Um, but the lady on the right is very well authenticated. She's the current longest lived person in the world. Um, she's in Spain. Um, she makes um, some interesting comments about wh why she thinks she's lived so long. Um, you know, generally a, a relaxing life, tranquility, good connection with families, and so on. And she also says staying away from toxic people which I think we all agree is quite, quite good advice. So, as I say, very positive features, but what it means is that we're living to much greater ages than we did in our evolutionary past, when a good old age would have been about 40. And what that means is that the later part of our lifespans has not been subject to natural selection. It hasn't been tuned because it hasn't seen people on the whole who've lived that long. And for that reason, things go wrong later in life. That, that's why it happens. It's this relaxation and increased survival. And what that means is that there's a very strong association actually between advancing age and most diseases, that the vast majority of diseases with an ICD code are age related. Um, these are th the three big ones here, cardiovascular disease at the top, um, dementias in the middle and uh, cancer at the bottom. Two sexes color coded again, there's a big difference for cancer, men get more cancer than women do. Um, and you've got two low income, two middle income, and two high income countries there. Um, so obviously there's a, a big variation in the intensity of medical effort and diagnosis in those places. Um, but however you cut it, you can see this big increase in the instance of these major diseases with age. And that means that clinicians are also seeing people who've got more than one thing wrong with them, multimorbidity. Um, these are actually data from Scotland for men. I think they're particularly nice, nicely illustrated. Women look very similar, and so do most other places. Um, what's plotted is age groups along the bottom here up to age 85, and then the percentage of that age group who've either got nothing wrong with them, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, diseases. And you, you can see this increase in the proportion of people who've, you know, by the later ages, really got a lot of things wrong with them. 
And that's highly problematic for clinicians, partly because different diseases often require different kinds of treatment. You're looking at a complex person in front of you, and you really have to think how to treat it. But also, I think a much underestimated problem, but which geriatricians say is very important, is interactions between drugs that are used to treat different conditions. So this really is a, a, a global challenge, I think. Should we try to cure unhealthy aging? I think there is an ethical question to be answered here. You know, people tend to think of um, disease and disability during aging as just something natural and inevitable that happens. But we haven't taken that view about infectious diseases or things that go wrong with children. And personally, I think older people have just a bigger right as any other age class to have our attention to try and keep them healthier for longer. And the kind of research that I and loads of other people, including Kirsten, do is to try to find ways of, of compressing that bad period at the end of life. It's not to make people live longer, that's happening already. It's to try to reduce this period of disability and ill health at the end of life. It's called compression of morbidity. And that may sound rather naive as a name, but I think there's plenty of evidence we should be able to do it. Um, one is that aging isn't inevitable. There are creatures that don't age. Um, these are just some of them. Um, so you've got sea anemone. This is the little freshwater hydra. Um, and this is a planarian worm. All the rather simple um, body organization. They have these differentiated kind of sheets of cells that surround them. But they're basically bags of stem cells. So they've got lots of these un undifferentiated cells that can divide and give rise to the tissues. And these creatures have incredible powers of regeneration. You can often cut them in half and they're just fine. And also these undifferentiated cells can give rise to the germline, the eggs and the sperm that will make the next generation. And those features probably um, go a long way to explaining why as time goes by, they're no more likely to die, no less able to reproduce. They're just flatline. And also there is some you know, aging is a trait that evolves in its own right in more conventional creatures. Um, just some interesting guys are shown here. So um, I think this is the mammalian re record holder, the bowhead whale. Um, it can make about 200 years. They've actually been um, aged by the harpoon heads that are found embedded in them from earlier um, whaling efforts. Um, nobody does a 200-year study, um, but that's how they've been aged. This creature turned up a few years ago. The Greenland shark lives in the North Atlantic. It can live for 400 years, and it doesn't start breeding until it's 150. It takes that long to reach reproductive maturity. And then at the bottom, this, this little ocean quahog, it's just a standard you know, bivalve mollusk, lives on the floor of the Atlantic. Um, and they've been aged at the isotope aging now, 507 years, I think, is their record. And these two are here just to make the point that you know, the bowhead whale doesn't live 200 years because it's big. There's no necessary correlation between how big a thing is and how long it lives, although intuitively we tend to think there is. Um, these are just two real counter examples. This is the fascinating naked mole rat. They're um, highly social animals that live in colonies underground. They're about intermediate in size between a mouse and a rat. And they can live 30 years, which is a huge lifespan for a rodent. And then finally, this little Brant's bat, you can just see him sitting on someone's finger, um, only weighs eight grams, and he can live for almost 40 years. So we've got this trait, aging, that can evolve to happen at very different rates and different kinds of things. And of course, what that means is that there must be genes involved in determining the rate of aging, because these creatures have different rates because they differ genetically. So there's been a lot of interest in trying to find the genes that affect the rate of aging and see what they do and whether we can use the information to help people. There are some aging syndromes in humans, but sadly they're ones that speed it up. And thank goodness they're extremely rare. Um, these are the two main ones. Um, this is Hutchinson Guilford progeria on the left. It's the more severe of the two. So the children are normal until they're about 18 months, two years old. 
and then it becomes apparent that they are showing features of accelerated aging. So they lose their hair and subcutaneous fat, their um, joints start to become stiff. And they typically don't make it much beyond their teens. They usually die of cardiovascular disease. Werner's syndrome on the right is much less severe. It becomes apparent in the teenage years and the affected people make it usually into their 40s. And in that case, it's both cancer and cardiovascular disease that tend to be accelerated. And I think these syndromes, tragic though they are, they do tell us something interesting about normal aging because they both involve problems with the genetic material itself. So um, Hutchinson Guilford progeria is actually a mutation in one of the proteins that's in the um, envelope of the nucleus of the cell. So it means that the contents of the nucleus where the genetic material is become disarranged. And so it's not controlled properly. The expression of genes goes wrong. Ferner syndrome is actually a molecule. It's called a helicase that is involved in replication of DNA. So I think what this is telling us is that maintenance of the genome in good order as we go through aging is really important. But of course, what we'd really like to do is to find genes that are capable of slowing aging down and increasing the healthy period of life. And for that, these creatures have been extremely useful. So they're the laboratory model organisms. They're kind of the workhorses, really, of, of modern life sciences. Um, so you've got yeast, top left, um, nematode worm, top right, Drosophila, which is one of my favorite animals, and mouse. And they've been so useful, basically, because of the principle of evolutionary conservation. So, for instance, if you want to know how um, the genetic material is transmitted, how it's expressed, how metabolism works for the multicellular ones, how the nervous system works, the mechanisms turn out to be incredibly conserved in evolution. So if you take a gene from one of these creatures or from a human and put it into one of the others, you often find that it works perfectly well in its new environment. But I think for a long time we had a sort of mental block about aging because these creatures live for very different lengths of time. So a worm can make about three weeks, fly about three months, mouse about three years. And they encounter very different kinds of challenges and parasites and food types and things as they go through life. And so you know, why should they have mechanisms of aging in common with each other? Um, but eventually my, my personal heroine in, in this whole story just stopped thinking too much and just did the experiment. So she was working with Xenorhabditis, the, the nematode worm, and what she did was simply to, to do a mutagenesis experiment. So she fed the worms chemical mutagen, she then collected the mutated progeny and said, well, can I make a strain of worms that's long-lived? because of a mutation. And she found that she could, I mean, spectacularly so. Um, so this is the famous uh, DAF2 mutation. This is the survival curve now. These are the control worms here, the, the open boxes. And you can see that in the mutant, there's a huge extension of both the mean and the maximum lifespan of the animals. And very importantly, they were still wriggling around and healthy long after the controls had died. It wasn't just an extension of the moribund period at the end of life. And so here we've got something that's keeping the worms healthy and making them live longer. Furthermore, there are a lot of um, worm models, this is generally true of these model organisms, of human age-related diseases, so cancer, neurodegenerative disease, and so on. And it turns out that if you combine this mutation with the disease models, you can actually reduce the pathology. So this is just one example where that lab did this. So this poor thing here, this is an Alzheimer's worm. So what the experimenters have done is to take one of the proteins, a beta, which is very important in the brains of Alzheimer's patients, and they've expressed it in the muscles of the worm. And as you can see, it's in really poor shape. Its back end's completely paralyzed and front end's kind of waving around rather feebly. But what they found when they combined this with the DAF2 mutation was that they got a nice wriggly worm. They really restored normal locomotion. And the equivalent was true for a number of other diseases. So this is a pretty interesting mutation. 
it can make the worm healthy and it can combat disease models. It took a while to figure out what it was and eventually it turned out to be a mutation in the gene that encodes the worm insulin, insulin-like growth factor receptor. So much more familiar from mammals, insulin-like growth factor for its role in growth and wound healing. Um, insulin, of course, for control of metabolism, blood glucose, and so on. And actually, I don't think anyone suspected that the whole um, network was present in um, these little invertebrates. I mean, what it does is to sense the current status of the animal, its nutrient status, are there stresses involved, is there infection, and so on. And so it's, it's a good times network, provided everything's okay, the worm can grow, reproduce, metabolize, and so on. But if there's a problem, then those activities are shut down and instead stress responses are activated. And what's happened with this DAF2 mutation is that they're activated even when everything's perfectly okay and they're making the worm live longer and healthier. So that was all very interesting, but you know, we want long-lived people, not long-lived worms. So is this evolution really conserved? Happily, it turned out it was. Um, so these are now progressing up through the, the fly and the mouse. These are equivalent mutations in these two. Um, they're, they're actually a different gene, but the same signaling network. And you can see in both cases the extension of lifespan. And again, it was an increase in healthy lifespan. So in the mice, in the initial study that was done on this, um, what could be seen in the mutant was that despite the fact that this is messing around with insulin signaling, actually their glucose homeostasis was better as they aged. Um, they had a better immune profile, more naive T cells. Um, they were more agile. They could hang on for longer to a rotating rod. And they got less osteoporosis. You can see the cataract here in the eye of the control mouse. Um, and this ulcerative dermatitis on the neck about 40% of the controls get that during aging. Never seen a case in the mutants. So I think what's so interesting here is the very broad spectrum effect of this mutation. You know, different tissues, different systems, different functions, all being improved by just this one mutation, which I think is why they're so interesting. And again, in the mouse, there's been quite a bit of work looking at whether, as in the worm, um, they can rescue age-related pathology associated with disease models. Again, just looking at Alzheimer's, um, this is a rather standard test of learning and memory um, in mice, the Morris water maze. Um, and what happens is that to start with, um, you've got this cloudy liquid and there's actually this little shady thing here is a, a platform just below the surface of the water. And although mice are very good swimmers, they prefer not to. So if they can find the platform, they'll again stand on it. So to start with, they're trained with a flag on the platform. So they learn where the platform is, they associate it with the flag, and also with these landmarks around the maze. And then what you eventually do to see what they've learned and what they've remembered is to take the flag away and ask whether they locate the search in the general area of the platform and find it more quickly. So if we do that with uh, these mice, um, then the Alzheimer's mouse, here on the left, you see him swimming with his tail. And what he does is to swim pretty randomly around the Morris maze. Whereas if it's combined, again, with a mutant, it's a more localized search for this mice and he actually finds the platform pretty quickly. Um, obviously, that's an anecdote. This has been you know, properly quantified with numerous mice and, and proper measures and so on. So the, the Alzheimer's mice at this stage are not impaired in their swimming. They can get around just as fast as the ones combined with the mutant. But as you can see, he's still swimming and hasn't found the platform. And the learning and memory in the mouse is very well understood in terms of you know, which bits of the nervous system are important. And this is just showing some of the changes in the brains of these mice. So the Alzheimer's show, um, eventually show uh, reduced motor coordination as well as memory impairment. This brain inflammation you can see here, so this is a large scale section of the brain, this is, is looking closer in. And you can see these astrocytes, the star-shaped cells, are staining dark. They're staining for markers of brain inflammation, which is one of the major pathologies in Alzheimer's disease. But that's rescued, as is the eventual loss of nerve cells that happens. So again, you know, powerful mutant that can really um, 
improve health during aging. The way that this is mainly being looked at in humans at the moment is taking a candidate gene approach. So looking at the human genome for the equivalent genes to the ones that have been shown to be important in the model organisms, and then saying, well, if we look in very long-lived families or individuals, are there genetic peculiarities in those genes that could be explaining their longevity. And one of the interesting things about really long-lived people who live well into their 90s or over 100 or even over 110 is that they do show this compressed morbidity. They tend to be healthy ages. So it's an interesting one to look at. And these are just some of the studies that have come out on that. Um, so you can see a lot of insulin IGF is coming up. Um, also, TOR is here somewhere. This is an intracellular um, part of the network, very evolutionarily ancient. And this FOXO is very important. Um, it's something called a transcription factor. So it's a protein that switches genes on and off. And it's one of the effector transcription factors for the insulin IGF signaling. So when, as in DAF2, you tamp down the activity, that FOXO becomes activated and it's that he's one of the transcription factors that goes into the nucleus and turns on these stress response genes. And there's been, I think it's seven different studies have found a consistent association now between two particular variants in that FOXO and extraordinary lifespans in humans. So I think it's early days there, but interesting indications. So what about interventions? How might we be able to use this to actually help people? It turns out that this signaling network actually um, mediates the effects of an intervention that's been known about for a lot longer, uh, which is dietary restriction, <laughs> which was actually first discovered to increase lifespan in rats in the 1930s. And since then, it's been shown to have that effect in all these organisms. So what you do is you take a normal wild-type animal and look at how much it's eating, and then you have a dietary restricted group where you just give them a proportion of what the control group are eating. And in rodents, rats and mice, you can do that really quite severely. You can take them down to half you know, what the control animals are eating. And you see this dose-dependent increase in lifespan and an extraordinarily broad spectrum improvement in health during aging. Practically everything that goes wrong during aging in a rodent is rescued to some extent um, by dietary restriction. There are just two things that they're bad at. Um, one is wound healing, so if there's any question of trauma, they have to be refed. And they're also rather bad at combating some viral infections. Again, if there's a flu infection, they have to be refed. But it, it's, a, a, a very, it's still the most powerful intervention that we have. And because of that, there, there have been a couple of studies of rhesus monkeys, both done in the US. These are the first two publications that came out from those studies, um, which were reporting on lifespan and, and some of the other phenotypes. It's a really interesting case to me of, um, in a methodology of science, so these were two groups that were both asking the question, does dietary restriction increase lifespan and improve health during aging in rhesus monkeys? They actually implemented their studies in very different ways, which we can discuss after if you want. Uh, one of them found an increase in lifespan, the other didn't. They could only take the monkeys down to about 70% of control intake. Below that, they, they started to seriously um, lose weight. But what they both found was a very broad spectrum improvement in health. So the papers on this are still coming out, actually. Um, but these are just some of the things that have been shown already. So um, big um, improvement in skeletal mass, physical activity, um, improvements to the blood system, immune function. Um, the brain was better, less iron accumulation, um, less loss of nerve cells. They get less diabetes, less cancer, and less cardiovascular disease, the three big ones. So it, it's an impressive study. These animals live 40 years, so it's a really um, heroic bit of work. But the bad news is that for most humans, dietary restriction is simply not implementable. People 
can't adhere to it. Um, it it's an unfortunate thing that to get the, the health benefits, most people just cannot sustain the regime. So there's been a well, there's been one big study in the US where they've tried to do a proper clinical trial on dietary restriction, and they've had some success with the people who did stay in. Um, they could only reduce their food intake by about 14%, and over a two-year period. But the most notable thing was the dropout rate. So from thousands of volunteers, they ended up with two or 300 subjects in, in the actual study. Um, but over that period, it's quite clear that markers of cardiovascular disease, risk factors for cardiovascular disease are down. Um, there's less inflammation, and they're more resistant to weight gain. So some interesting things there, um, but it's not a practicable public health measure for humans. But there are some important things that have been discovered about dietary restriction that might be more easily implemented. One thing is that it's clear that it's not just calories that are important. It matters what nutrients you actually take out of the diet. And one of the ones that's turned out to be particularly important is protein. So protein in the diet is quite complicated because it acts in a lot of different ways. But both humans and mice have a target protein intake. So they have physiological systems for detecting how much protein they're getting. And they want to get a certain amount over a period of time. And what that means is that if protein is low in the diet, people and mice will overeat. They'll keep eating until they get the protein they want. And that means they eat too much of everything else. So there's an appetite issue with protein. Um, but there are also some other ones. Um, so this was a study that initiated a whole cascade of work some years ago. Um, and basically what it, it's showing is that there's a yin and yang um, with protein, and one size doesn't fit all with age in either humans or mice. So up to about the age of 65, not, going, not having any more protein than your target intake is a good thing because you see lower overall mortality and particularly reduced cancer mortality in people who eat just the right amount of protein. The problem after age 65 is muscle weakness. And there, increasing protein in the diet can actually combat the sarcopenia that comes with age. And with older people, that's more important. So probably the protein intake should be age specific. And obviously that's something that would be fairly easily implementable. The same story in mice, except of course here experimental rather than people just reporting what they eat. Very similar story, low protein diets um, decrease tumor progression, whereas high increase it. But once the mouse is older, you start to see this wasting weight loss and sarcopenia, which is mainly due to loss of mass or mass. And if you increase the protein in the diet, it improves that. So, uh, and there's other stories with other macronutrients, with salt, with sugar, and so on. So simply getting the composition of the diet right, I think is something that's very important. The other thing that I think is increasingly coming to people's attention is that it probably matters when we eat. Um, so, you know, we've got electric lights, uh, we stay up late, a lot of us work and tend to have our main meal, you know, in the hours of darkness in the evening. But actually a lot of evidence suggests that it's best to eat over a, a constrained period of time. And that period should be the active period uh, rather than the sleep period. Um, so this is just some nice experimental work that was done on this with mice. So they actually had ordinary, you know, just wild type mice and um, a genetic model of obesity. And these guys lack the leptin receptors so that they're not detecting their own fat and they tend to become obese. And what the experimenters did was to simply look at what happens if you restrict feeding to the active period, which is the, the night period for mice because they're nocturnal. And the results are shown here on the right. So if you've got a beast mice and you time restrict them, so they could eat over a 10 hour period during the dark, they don't eat any less than if they can eat all the time, if they can snack. But what you find is that they're obese, but their metabolic profile is actually much better than with the continuously fed ones. And if you do that with um, wild type mice, uh, you get exactly the same effect. They become obese if they, so mice get very large with age if they're ad libitum fed. But if you time restrict them, again, they eat the same, but they stay lean and fit. 
I think this bottom thing here may actually have had more to do with the experimenters than the mice. What they did was to give them the weekend off. And what they found was that with the lean mice, if they, if they had their regime Monday to Friday and then were allowed to eat what they liked at the weekend, actually it was very similar to a seven-day regime. It's not clear what's important here. It may be the time at which the food's eaten, or it may be the length of the starvation period, uh, the fasting period, when the food isn't being eaten. And one of the things about normal dietary restriction in an experimental setting is that they're fed once a day. And because they're dietarily restricted, they eat it all very quickly, and then don't eat for the next 22 or 23 hours. And it may actually be that fasting period that's important. So you can imagine there are lots of combinations and regimes here, but it's something that people are really looking into. So I think diet is, is obviously important, and the WHO, the World Health Organization at the moment, is really um, saying we must get exercise right, we must get diet right, and we must cut down smoking, and that will have a major impact on health and the elderly. So quite a lot of it's in our own hands. But nonetheless, it's the case that even people who live an absolutely um, impeccable lifestyle still get many of the uh, problems that happen with aging. So what other forms of interference might there be? And I think here, what's important is that lots of work by lots of people over the last 20 years, really, have told us what the underlying mechanisms of aging are. They vary a bit between different tissues, different kinds of animals, and so on. But basically, they're nearly always all there. Um, so generally, I think it's believed that it probably kicks off with things going wrong at the level of gene expression. So damage to the DNA, the way that it's packaged in the nucleus, the molecules attached to it, nibbling away at the ends of the chromosomes with this uh, telomere attrition. All of these mean that gradually cells lose control of the expression of their genes. And that then knocks on to loss of control of the proteins, which of course the major effector molecules in cells. I've said a lot about this one already, deregulated nutrient sensing, insulin, IGF, TOR and so on, seems to drive at levels that work fine in youth, but too strong in old age. So if we slightly tamp it down, we improve health. These powerhouses of the cells, the mitochondria, also important in many other biochemical processes, they go down with age. The cellular senescence has come to quite a lot of prominence recently. So normally, it's a, it's a strange term, it doesn't quite describe what it means. Normally during wound healing or during development, tissues have to be remodeled, which means that bits of tissue have to be destroyed and others built. And the cells that do the destroying are these senescent cells. They're very biologically active. They spit out cytokines and other molecules. And when they've done their job with the routine or the development, then um, cells from the immune system come and remove them. But that removal goes wrong during aging, so they accumulate in tissues and cause damage. And they're thought to be actually a major um, cause of the inflammation that happens during aging. Stem cells go wrong, so they either differentiate when they shouldn't or fail to respond to the normal signals that would say divide and differentiate to regenerate the tissue. And the whole systemic environment becomes uh, problematic. So we see this age-related inflammation and also other things just going wrong in the circulatory domain. And these things aren't independent. They're, they're all going on in parallel and interacting with each other. But th they are the main players in the aging process. So I think really the central idea of a, a lot of people at the moment is that if we could interfere with one or more of these, then we might be able to prevent multiple things that go wrong during aging simultaneously. Because there are an awful lot more things that go wrong than there are of these aging processes. So I think we would be talking about intervening with drugs, metabolites, and so on, really uh, more active intervention than just lifestyle. Now, I know that will induce a yuck factor in some of you, um, partly because of this sort of thing, things that have not been through clinical trials but are sitting on the shelves in pharmacies, drug stores, and so on. And Indeed, I, I, personally, I would never dream of taking something that hadn't been through a clinical trial. But there are plenty of things that have been through clinical trials and that are taken in exactly the way that I'm suggesting. And the two most obvious would be these statins 
which are taken to control blood lipids and taken by millions of people worldwide. In fact, in the UK, the, NH, the National Health Service has basically said, give statins to anyone who wants them. And also um, drugs that lower blood, pre blood pressure if it's too high. And they're taken purely preventatively. They're taken by a lot of people over a long period. You know, neither alter blood lipids nor high blood pressure diseases. They're just risk factors for disease. And I don't think most of us have problems with a drug like that. And that's what we're talking about. It's just ones that might have rather more broad spectrum effects on the things that go wrong during aging. So we'd be suggesting this sort of thing. And I think it would have huge problems for de novo drug development to actually make a new drug that's capable of preventing a big part of the aging process. Because we're talking about long term, it's going to have to be extremely safe. Regulators are going to be very interested in a new drug that affects all of these. The trials are going to be incredibly expensive um, because we're talking about a lot of people over a, a long period. So I think the challenges for new drugs to treat major aspects of the aging process are huge. But again, I think the good news here is that a lot of existing drugs actually affect these underlying processes of aging, not surprisingly, because they're used to treat age-related diseases. And they really are candidates for repurposing. So we already know the safety profile and so on. A lot of the heavy lifting of this kind has already been done. So just thinking about the nutrient sensing network in that regard for a moment, you know, OK, diet and exercise, but what else? This is what it looks like in Drosophila. Um, so we've got the extracellular uh, ligand, so insulin, IGF, in mammals, receptors, just one in the fly. And then we have this bifurcation in the pathway below the receptor. This is a RAS pathway, which is incredibly important in cancer. Um, this is the, what, what's known as the standard insulin signaling pathway. Here's FOXO, which goes in and out of the nucleus, depending what's happening. And this is the tall bit of it, which is much more evolutionarily ancient, purely intracellular, all involved in this nutrient sensing and control of activities. Um, we've been interested in three drugs here. Um, this drug, Tremetinib, which actually inhibits the molecule in the um, RAS pathway. It's an anti-cancer chemotherapeutic. It's used to treat a particular um, type and stage of malignant melanoma. Uh, rapamycin, uh, which in, it basically disrupt this thing, the protein complex, and rapamycin um, disrupts it. It's used to pr uh, prevent rejection of tissues after transplant, particularly kidneys. Um, also as a cancer chemotherapeutic and to prevent restenosis re-blocking after cardiac surgery. And finally, lithium here, uh, which is used to, or used to be used to treat um, bipolar disorder. And they all have these targets in this network. So they, these bits all signal to each other and control the activity of these various transcription factors in the nucleus. And what we found in the fly is that all three of the drugs individually extend lifespan. And you get an extremely powerful effect if you combine them. So this is a complicated network with feedbacks and all kinds of loops in it. And it turns out that going for different bits of it simultaneously has a particularly powerful effect. So this is the story for lifespan. These are survival curves. So the controls here, you can see that each of the three on their own produces a nice extension. If we do the three double combinations, we do even better. If we give them all three, we get a stonking great extension with the red line. That's 43% increase in median lifespan, which by fly standards is huge. And again, if we look at what's actually happening to the flies, they're bouncing around and healthier for longer. So I think it's, it's an interesting proof of principle that this kind of approach can work applied to a network that we already know a lot about uh, because of genetics. It's also rather remarkable that these drugs that were developed for humans work perfectly well in flies, I think, because the targets are rather different. Um, but the one that's furthest along the road, I think, is this one, rapamycin, um, because it was the first drug clearly shown to extend lifespan in mice. Um, so this is work from the intervention testing 
program in the States. It was actually discovered on Easter Island. Um, an expedition went there a long time ago to look at whether there were microbes in the soil that produced molecules that prevented the um, growth and proliferation of mammalian cells. And that's how uh, rapamycin was discovered. And it's called rapamycin because the local name for the island is Rapa Nui. So it was named, named after the place where it was discovered. And you can see down here, this is the uh, um, National Institute of Aging Intervention Testing Program in the US. And you can see this very nice extension of lifespan, less in males than in females, but nonetheless nice and dose dependent in both sexes. And these uh, mice have been thoroughly phenotyped. Um, it's not perfect, it's a bit like dietary restriction, so most things uh, improve during aging. Um, the males, unfortunately, get testicular degeneration, so you would not want to give it during the reproductive period. Um, and uh, they also are more prone to uh, cataract. And they can become insulin resistant as well. So we really need to understand more about exactly how this drug works to try to separate the, the yin from the yang effects. And that's something that we've been involved with. But I think the important thing about it is that it's starting to tell us how this sort of thing's going to go through to humans. Um, so this, I think, is a, a very, very nice study led by Joe Manick, who's... Um, uh, leads a, a series of spin-out companies after working at Novartis. And what she's done he here is to exploit some information from mice. So just like older people, older mice don't respond very well to immunization against flu. So um, some other people had done an experiment where they pre-treated the mice with rapamycin, let them clear it, and then immunized them. And they found that they got a much better immune response to the immunization and the mice were much better protected against flu if they'd had this pretreatment. So Joan essentially did the same clinical trial with elderly humans and she found the same thing that if she pretreated, not actually with rapamycin, with a proprietary drug that does very similar things, um, that she could boost the immune response and there were fewer respiratory infections in the ensuing winter. So I think this is the sort of way that these drugs are going to move in, is, is through particular indications to start with. So rapamycin, for instance, is being looked at in the context of mild cognitive impairment at the moment. And another drug that interacts with the nutrient sensing network is metformin, of course, very widely used. It's the first line of defense against type 2 diabetes, an incredibly safe drug taken by very large numbers of people. And it's interesting because it's now registered for the first clinical trial against aging. So the um, FDA in the US have accepted aging as a reason for repurposing a drug. So they're looking at multiple outcomes. And they're just getting this uh, study financed at the moment. So I think things are gently moving in that direction. Um, I think more looking at the distant horizon. I mentioned these um, senescent cells that hang around and make a nuisance of themselves in aging tissues. Um, one of the contexts in which they do that is um, osteoarthritis. And there are now a class of drugs that selectively kill senescent cells and leave healthy ones um, unaffected. They're rather toxic if taken systemically, although they've been shown to reduce um, cellular senescence in tissues in mice, improve um, tissue function, and even to extend lifespan. But th there is definitely a downside to these um, senolytic drugs, as they're called. But the nice thing about joints is that they're isolated capsules. So it's possible to treat the joint without treating anything else. And this is an experiment in mice where they've started to look at the effect of removing the senescent cells on, on what goes on. And it, it worked quite nicely in the mice. Um, so far, a clinical trial with um, humans, just very small scale, um, has not produced anything very usable. So I think there's a way to go with this. But I think it's a very interesting approach. The other place would be the eye. Um, because a lot of the things that go wrong in the eye during aging are associated, again, with cellular senescence. I think more practically, although um, somewhat Frankenstein, are these experiments um, with systemic factors. So it was shown a long time ago now, although not understood at all at the time, that if you can join the buds, blood supply of two mice, so you actually join them up, you can do that with mice because within a strain they're genetically identical, so there's no um, rejection. 
then you can do the controls. You can join two young or two old mice up, but you can also do the young old pairing. And what's been shown repeatedly with that is that the stem cells in multiple tissues in the older mice show improved function as a result of the pairing. Um, this is not a good way to do these experiments. Um, it's really obvious if you actually look at a film of what goes on in, in the cages, um, uh, quite apart from the ethical challenge involved, um, young mice are much more active than older mice. So this old guy here is basically being forced to run around the cage by the younger mouse, and that may have much to do with, with what goes on. So these are done with plasma transfers now, and people are starting to identify either bad stuff that accumulates in young blood or rejuvenating things that are present in, in young blood but not old blood. And I wouldn't be surprised if this one actually yields usable results quite quickly. And there's huge interest in all of this from startups. So I went the first conference I went to after the pandemic was last year in, in Copenhagen. And these were just the sponsors of that quite small local meeting. And uh, you know this doesn't even have the big players listed in it. So it's an area where there's huge inward investment and a lot of entrepreneurial work going on. And I think for that reason, you know, we're really going to find out rather fast which of these approaches is going to work and which isn't. The health economics of, of doing this um, look good. I mean, the economic cost of, of treating aging-related disease is huge. Um, the, the most recent one shown at the bottom there, it's a really interesting read. But I think it, it really would be a win-win if, if we can get this one to go. So I'm, I'm optimistic that we, we will see some very interesting developments in the, the next few years. So to summarize, Mechanisms of aging lead to age-related diseases, so it's clear that, the, that those mechanisms I showed you are present in the etiology of multiple aging-related diseases. You can target this nutrient-sensing network with a cocktail of drugs, which is very effective. We also have unpublished data showing that the same thing is true in mice. And emerging opportunities include removal of senescent cells and rejuvenation of circulating factors. And I hope what we're going to see is a broad spectrum preventative set of interventions for the diseases of aging with benefits both to people and to economics of healthcare. And I'd like to thank you for listening and putting up with my voice and to thank the people who've financed our own research. And I'm very happy to answer questions. <laughs>